Haifa, the last British troops leave Palestine, and very few of them can have been sorry. As the tanks and soldiers went aboard the transports, the thought that a difficult and thankless job had been well done must have mattered much less than the prospect of going home. The Union Jack was hauled down and the doors closed for good on the British mandate. Tel Aviv, key Jewish city, is all rejoicing as the elected head of the provisional government, David Ben-Gurion, arrives to read the proclamation of a new nation, the State of Israel. War with the Arab states for which Ben-Gurion had mobilized the entire Zionist movement now began. Armies from five Arab states and armed volunteers from all over the Arab world marched into Palestine. Isolated Jewish settlements and the Jewish quarter in the old city of Jerusalem were captured. Amid the carnage, 7,000 Jews now became refugees. By this time, more than 300,000 Palestinians had been uprooted from their homes. The first time I think that I literally understood that we are not going back to Jaffa and nobody is going back to their homes in Israeli-occupied Palestine was probably uh, in the summer of 48, that is July, August. That's the first when we began to read underground leaflets issued by nationalist groups attacking the Arab states and saying that the Arab states are in fact collaborating with the Zionists in the establishment of the state of Israel and frustrating the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state. That then we knew. King Abdullah of Transjordan now moved in to lay hands on the old city of Jerusalem. The Palestinian national community was being destroyed the prospect for Palestinian independence was rapidly fading away. The UN now sent a mediation mission to Palestine. I had just got into my office one morning and was having my first cup of coffee when a friend called me from division headquarters saying that overnight they got a dispatch orders for me to report immediately to headquarters Marine Corps for a further uh, assignment on temporary duty to the State Department to go to Palestine and be in the UN mission there. And that's all I knew. <laughs> so I, I went home and told my wife, guess what? <laughs> and she says, you're going somewhere. And I said, Palestine. And she says, oh my God, that's where the Bible was. Count Bernadotte, head of the Swedish Red Cross, was charged by the United Nations to bring peace to Palestine. He got the Arabs and the Israelis to agree to a 28-day truce that began on June the 11th, 1948. To assist him, Bernadotte assembled a team of soldiers from Scandinavia, Belgium, France and the United States. These men would be independent and important witnesses to events in Palestine. But once in the field, the UN observers found themselves powerless to stop the fighting. Theodore Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Well, the UN was speaking loudly but had no stick. Um, really, all we were doing was scorekeeping because neither side uh, had anything to fear from the UN. That it was, you know, it was toothless. Uh, they could shoot up Jerusalem or each other all they wanted. And we could report it. We could plead with them and, uh, and we could report them back to the Security Council and nothing happened. And uh, here I was, I was the operations officer of a peacekeeping mission, and all I'd ever done is fight wars, and you know, I didn't know anything about peace missions. The UN was also unable to prevent the Israelis using the ceasefires to reorganize and re-equip. On July the 7th, the fighting resumed. The Israelis now went over to the offensive. Advancing into territory assigned by the UN to the Arab state of Petition Palestine, they seized the twin towns of Lida and Ramla from the Jordanian Arab Legion. Legion. More than 50,000 Palestinians who had refused to flee their homes suddenly came under Israeli occupation. In Lida, uh, after we captured, there was an attempt by the Arab Legion again to penetrate uh, Lida and in the struggle there, most of the population uh, pushed out. 
they came, the, the, the Jewish soldiers, and with microphones and loudspeakers. Uh, that was early in the morning. And uh, uh, ordered that all the young men, uh, able-bodied men, be, be gathered into mosques and in, into, into churches. And they said that they would be back, you know, in a few hours. Many of these men never returned. The Israelis were alarmed by the number of Palestinians in Lida. In the uproar created by the Arab Legion raid, they shot the men detained inside one of the mosques. More than 80 were killed. Wherever there was a fighting in which there was a threat by the civilians, because uh, up to May 15, there was no clear line, uh, clear cut line between front and rear, civilians and military. And uh, in July, we felt the same. And therefore, even though we did not initiate at the very beginning the story of uh, the population, Arab population of Lida, when the Arab Legion succeeded to penetrate again to Lida, and we saw the uprising of the population, we had to carry out actions that practically brought about the evacuation of most of the population, not all, by the way. I just would follow the sound, you know, the sound of the tumult of those thousands of people, um, move along with them. Um, I think what was most memorable about this, perhaps, is the, one, is the thirst. Uh, we were very thirsty. Two, is the heat. And three, the terror. The Israelis would, uh, kept shooting, sometimes wantonly and sometimes, uh, perhaps in earnest. Uh, we would hear big explosions behind us. Um, planes would, uh, would go over, you know, fly low and, just to keep us moving, I think, and to keep us uh, terrified and moving. Um, I would hear people not moving, not walking, but lying on the ground. They couldn't, in other words, they couldn't move anymore. Sometimes I would hear the sound of the voice of a baby, of a woman with a baby, sometimes of old people lying down, unable to move. And this would touch me much, and sometimes it would uh, frighten me that I would perhaps have the same fate. Indeed, uh, it wasn't long before I had to sit down and uh, take rest, to take some rest, but then also uh, I would be afraid that I wouldn't be able to get up. Hundreds perished in the three-day march from Lida to the Arab Legion lines. For years, this episode was hidden from the outside world. In 1979, Yitzhak Rabin described the Lida Ramla expulsions in his autobiography. Israeli censors removed this section from his book. Every book which is written by any Israeli former general or politician, and he publishes something that uh, he got uh, from his uh, uh, official role, in addition to the military censorship, he has to pass it to a committee of members of the cabinet. And it was not the military censorship that uh, cut this uh, parts that you refer to, I assume. It was uh, made by political observation, and they had their own reasons. Israeli writer Peretz Kidron translated Rabin's Hebrew manuscript into English. In the book, uh, Rabin describes how the two towns were occupied, the fighting continued beyond the towns, and he is the commander, he and Yigal Alon, who was the, the, the area commander, uh, were perplexed about this whole situation. They had tens of thousands of Arab civilians behind their lines, and they didn't know what to do. Uh, ben Gurion came to visit their front, their front line headquarters and they put the question to him and strangely enough Ben Gurion simply ignored the question and they asked him repeatedly again and again Ben Gurion ignored the question and it was only finally when they walked outside 
presumably to some place where Ben Gurion was absolutely certain that he couldn't be overheard. And the question was put to him again by Yigal Alon. Ben Gurion then made this gesture, which uh, very clearly implied, throw them out, drive them out. 